Welcome to the Wander Learn Podcast. This is Francis Tapon, and in this episode, I talk with Tim Butcher. He is an author, a British man who lives in South Africa. He's written two books on Africa about these epic tre- treks that he did through there. He did one through West Africa and the other one through the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. His trips were kind of mimicking the trips of the early explorers. He has some great insight. We talk about what it's like to live in South Africa now. Is Africa broken? And if so, why is it broken? He talks about what it's like to fall in the footsteps of these great explorers. Is there any remnants in the Congo about how things were before? Is it changed? Has it changed a lot from what he read? He talks about the deaths that have happened in the Congo. Is it as bad as it looks from afar? And we get into also his new book, which is about Gavio Principe, the guy who started World War I. He was a Bosnian man who set off the flame to get the whole war started. This is Franz Tapon. Enjoy this episode with Tim Butcher. Welcome to the Wander Learn Podcast. I'm here with Tim Butcher, who is a world traveler and author of three books. Uh, One is called Blood River, Chasing the Devil, and The Trigger. Those are his three books. Welcome, Tim. Hi, thanks for having me on. Thank you. And you are coming in from South Africa, Johannesburg, correct? Yes, I'll throw you slightly. I have a British accent. I'm British born, but I've lived in South Africa for a number of years. I lived overseas from the UK all over the world. But I've, I, I'm talking to you from my home where I've set up home with my family in Cape Town, South Africa. So right at the, at the heel of Africa, right at the bottom. Since you are in Cape Town, when was the last time you took a shower? Well, you see, getting on this show was a very important <laughs> thing for me. So I've had a shower, first one in weeks. I'm delighted. What an honor. Unfortunately, <laughs> We don't. We can't convey odor yet by MP3 <laughs> files and WAV files. But um, believe you me, some houses in Cape Town are stretching. We are we are a city running low on water. But truth be told, um, what it's actually done is made people think about that product, uh, think right. about that assumption that there's water everywhere. So people are changing their thoughts, and it's not a bad thing. So people aren't lawn. You know, why would you have a a big lawn? In, in Africa when you're in drought conditions. How silly is that? So people are ripping up lawns. Why would you have a bath when you should have a shower for 90 seconds? So people are changing their lifestyles. It's not, it's not hurting anyone. They're just changing their lifestyles. That's a very good point because when I was growing up in California, we had about a seven-year drought and exactly the same thing happened. When all of a sudden, all this education campaign, they taught us take three-minute or two-minute showers and you know get rid of your lawn, put drought-tolerant plants and on and on and uh, as a result some of that legacy kind of is still there so that now even though we don't have such a big water shortage um, people have learned to put low flush toilets and all sorts of things so it's in some ways it is certainly a blessing in disguise yeah i think the the way it's been managed here in cape town has been quite clever because they put the fear into people they did a lot of international the very fact you're in cameroon you know about the war situation in cape town you know it's been all over the internet it's been all over the websites it's been all over the broadcasters a city running out of water and i think you know they weren't it it was not i don't regard that as panicking i don't regard them as trying to spread panic because it was managed well they just drilled home how important it is to manage your water and i think as you say it's it's, legacy is a good word um our behavior as a family at a micro level has changed. And I think I think a lot more now about things I never thought about. We used to have a sprinkler you know, on the lawn. It's insane to sprinkle water onto a lawn. Absolutely insane. <laughs> um, why can't you deal with, you know, have wood down, have uh, a wooden decking or sand? We're in a desert city for crying out. Why would you have lawns? Why would you have herbaceous borders? So they've all gone and we've got beautiful plants that are of the environment indigenous plants what is called fein boss the fine bush the old afrikaans term for the plants and it's transformed the garden in a very positive way so yeah the legacy i think if, it, if handled intelligently you can you can use it well yeah it's it's certainly true and i i remember how it really uh, in california it was it's 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 amazing how many people are not wasting water as much as they used to but the funny thing is also tim is that i was reading about this and it sounded like i can't remember the exact statistic you probably know it something like 300 liters per person or something like that or maybe it was 30 liters i can't remember what it was but all i could think is whatever that number was it was a lot less than the average person in the Sahara is using on a daily basis. Absolutely, absolutely. That's one of the one of the common themes. We might talk about that when we talk about Africa later. That the way that Africa is presented 
through the media, through through people who write books like me, through the voice, through observers, sometimes actually actually forget the reality of what people, the, the lifestyles that people live, that are forced to live. So when a city like Cape Town runs out of water, suddenly the, an alarm is sounded, the flare goes into the sky, the city is running out of water, people are going to have to cut down to, and it happens to be 50 litres at the moment, but that number is an arbitrary, relatively arbitrary number can change. And then I think, well, hold on, when I was in Liberia, you know, people didn't have access to clean water as an assumption, and they would go to rivers and they would get ill, and we're in an area where there's Ebola, or there's Lassa, or there's Bilhazia, or there's other waterborne diseases. So the simple expedient thing of building a covered well, a covered well, the influence, the word there being covered, because if you cover it, it means no nasties can go into it, transforms lives, transforms them. And, you know, as you know, you're in an area in Cameroon, Nigeria, just across the border in Nigeria, you have one of the highest child mortality rates from diarrhea alone, just from diarrhea, which is spread by open water uh, contamination. So uh, it just, you know, we should just sort of take the dial a little bit and turn it to control, to a control uh, position where we're comparing like with like rather than, oh, Cape Town should be like London or Los Angeles. No, it's an African city. Let's remember what the rest of Africa is like. And I can't, you don't have to go many miles from here to take you to places where people do not have running water as a, as a natural given. And therefore, um, to assume that it is a natural given is plain wrong. Well said. Now you have three books, and I just want to give a quick overview of each one because they're all based, based on, well, two of the first two, the ones in Africa, are based on kind of you retracing the steps of prior European explorers. Uh, the first one, uh, if you want to give it the overview of Blood River, basically you were retracing Henry Morton Stanley's Actually, he's not European. Well, he's kind of quasi-European. He's Welsh and he's American. And he, re- he, he crossed the, the Congo River and the Congo, uh, the entire Congo. And you kind of went through his steps, didn't you? I did. And I'm always slightly reluctant to you know, be described as someone who follows in someone's footsteps. Because, of course, one doesn't, want to, one doesn't want to be accused of, oh, you need to copycat. You're just a derivative. What did you do? Did you put on some crazy 19th century hat and try and dress like the guy? The exercise wasn't about copying or following per se the exercise was this that there are occasional moments in world history continental history african history where enormous change results from the actions of a limited number of individuals enormous systemic change and now you mentioned victorian explorers and people might go oh victorian explorers well there was livingston there was burton there was grant there was de Brazza, there was speak there was you know there's a long list of them and they all had long mustaches and they all you know wandered around with tents and you know they carried them you know all of that cleft stick cliche i'm not interested in that at all i'm interested in what are the actual journeys that change things and stanley's journey was transformative much more so i would argue than the Nile explorers or the Niger explorers or the continental, the edge of the, uh, the other explorers. And why was, it, why was it so monumentally important? It's monumentally important because it opened up the African interior to the white outsider. The white outsider had nibbled at the edges of Africa for hundreds of years, from the mid 15th century, when the Portuguese had worked out the shape of Africa perfectly by circumnavigating the whole thing. But they dare not go within Africa. Within was danger, within was the unknown, within were cataracts up rivers or tropical disease or hostility from local, the local population. And this was the way that Africa was framed. It was an unknown and it wasn't engaged with on any level, whether or not it was a good or bad, just ignored. You know, Africa was just in the way for those ships from Europe to go to the spices and to the silks of the Far East. It was literally, well, let's go round it. I'm sitting in Cape Town, and Cape Town was a city that was born purely as a supply station, a place for fresh water and fresh vegetables for those sailors sailing around Africa. They didn't go in. And Stanley's journey was extraordinary. It takes three years, 1874 to 77. It's a three-year slog across Africa from the East Coast to the West. And the reason it's important is that he finds and charts an amazing river. Those Europeans, those Portuguese I mentioned, they'd found the river hundreds of years before at the mouth. But the mouth was super dangerous. Once you went up it, you immediately hit cataracts. You walk around the cataracts, you were killed by malaria. If the malaria didn't get you, some other disease got you. And, um, and yada yada. And there were various attempts to go up, and they were all beaten back. Stanley comes from the other end, 
the other continental side, sweeps down this river, charts it, and comes back to Europe with a story. Remember, he is a newspaper man on this adventure. He is not a diplomat or a scientist or a geographer or a representative of any government. He's a grubby journalist, you know, worrying about his expenses. In fact, he worked for the same uh, company that you worked for at the time, The Telegraph, right? Indeed. I, there was a certain degree of resonance there when I found out that the most important, most impactful uh, correspondent of uh, in any newspaper history was a man who worked for the same newspaper as me. And I was honored to end up working basically like him 130 years later as Africa correspondent for the Daily Telegraph. But like all British ideas, there had to be an American element for it to work. And he also worked with for the New York Herald. He was employed by two newspapers, New York Herald for America, Daily Telegraph from London, and they gave him a bunch of cash and said, go and solve the mystery of the Congo River. So he does. And why is it important? Because he comes back with a story, and that story is of scientific interest, and it's of you know, geographic interest, but it's much more important because it starts the scramble for Africa. It is read by a Belgian king, a man with a big beard sitting in a castle dreaming of a colony in Belgium, Northern Europe. And he makes his move. Leopold II uses Stanley, uses his reports, and then actually hires Stanley as an agent. He goes back, Stanley stakes a little bit of Central Africa because he's found a river, and a river can be used as a superhighway. It's the internet of its age. We can get goods up by ship and other goods coming, and we can take manufactured goods from Europe in, and we can take natural resources out. This is perfect. It's brilliant. Let's go for it. And Stanley makes his move for the Belgian king, 1879, 1880, and blow me down three, four years later, we're in Berlin. It's the Congress of Berlin, and the entire African continent is staked by Europe, with the exception, of course, of Liberia and Ethiopia. So we have this extraordinary transformative moment, this river journey. Um, by Stanley, and that's what makes it interesting. And my other, my other trick, Chasing the Devil, similarly, I'm not just, oh, I want to follow a person who's been before. That's a useful device. It's helpful for me because it has a perspective of someone who's been before, and I can do a, com a comparison of before and after and try and see, try to, to, to join those two separate dots. But what's important for me is that Sierra Leone, Liberia, they were, I think, definitive in, in framing how outsiders saw Africa in the 1990s. People of Rwanda, they can remember Rwanda. They can remember some of the turbulence in the Congo. They can remember various other crises. But when, they, when Hollywood makes a film called Blood Diamonds, when Hollywood actually engages with Africa and sets up those images, stereotypes in some people's minds, cliches in others, which is the child soldier, the merciless brute chasing after diamonds scoured from the earth, mercilessly being exploited by white mercenaries. All of those things, when Hollywood can deal with it, woof, then you've got a big sick. And this is where that set of stereotypes and cliches were, were born, which is Sierra Leone, Liberia. And I, I'd been there as a journalist. And Francis, I have to tell you, I was defeated by it. I was terrified during the war. I had friends killed there. Uh, a dear colleague from the Balkans, uh, Kurt Shork, an American, very famous American journalist, he lost his life. May the 24th, 2000, we were all together in Freetown. Traumatizing experience, not because of the fear per se, traumatizing because I, I was, def I just couldn't understand, I couldn't make sense of a place where Charles Taylor could bubble to the surface. A despot, a thug, a brute. How could Charles Taylor take power? How could he win over people using his methods? And so by going on the journey that I did there was again to try to better understand. So uh, yes, they are journeys where I have a historical precedent, but they're not journeys to think, oh, let's just go and find a reason to put on an old fashioned hat and go and, and, and follow someone. They have to have some impact. And in both cases, they were very impactful on wider history. And then the Liberia Sierra Leone case, it was Graham Greene who was your kind of model, it wasn't he? Graham Greene, the English novelist, perhaps the most famous English novelist of the 20th century, the guy who brings us you know, the great fables and the great novels that are very entertaining, like The Honorary Consul or Travels with My Aunt, but also the great meaty novels that still stand the test of the t test of time. Books like uh, The Quiet American, Our Man in Havana, The Power and the Glory. A prodigious, prodigious and prolific writer, best known for his travel, the way he would go and travel to a place and then use his travel experience to frame a novel. He started out on a career 
of travel, of world exploration, of embracing foreign places. He started out amazingly as a 31 year old in Liberia of all places, which was such a remote place. And let's be honest, it's pretty remote today, but a hundred right. odd years ago, even more remote, extraordinary. Uh, when he was born, um, Green, and then it, the, he did this trip when he was as I say, in his 30s, so it's 1935. He goes to Liberia and he does so deliberately for you know for various reasons we can go into. And he was my model. He leaves a diary. He takes a female cousin with him. She leaves a diary. And they left little footprints, little cultural references, points that you can triangulate. A, a name of a village, a name of a river crossing, a mission station, a scientist, an old churchman, these sorts of things. And I followed that route. And it allowed me to cross the bad lands of my imagination, go to the places which I couldn't go to during the war of 1990s and 2000s in Sierra Leone and Liberia when the whole area was just too dangerous. I went there 2009, so it calmed down a bit, but it was a very beautiful journey because I was able to walk, physically walk it. Uh, whereas in the Congo, the Congo was so scary, I moved quickly on a motorbike mostly when I was going over land, a small little 125 motorbike sort of worming our way around through jungle trails and you know, uh, along old roads that have been eaten by the jungle and past bridges that have been washed away, but uh, the motorbike was nice and small so he could drag it over those rivers and drag it up embankments. But um, in Li Liberia, I was able to walk. And there's something very pure about walking because that allows you to, to feel the rhythm of a place and to pick up the rhythm of those who walk with you and take their advice and rest where they rest and drink where they drink and hear their stories. Uh, so that was a very pure journey for me, the uh, the walk through Sierra Leone and Liberia. It also, I think, takes you back into time. You're getting closer to Graham Greene by walking because uh, you don't have those big highways and cars as well. So you avoid that. Indeed. No, it was, um, uh, you know, I like to travel light. I don't, you know, do TV crews or any of that stuff, which is what some adventurers do. I just, because that just makes the whole experience cumbersome. And it means that your footprint isn't yours anymore. You can't control it. You've got a great clumping crowd with you. And uh, in the case of going on this particular journey through Sierra Leone, like we were crossing borders that hadn't really been crossed for a number of years by outsiders. We're going through an area which retrospectively, and this happened some years after we were there, is the place which was the epicenter of the Ebola outbreak of West Africa. Ebola, of course, is a name associated strangely by coincidence, given our conversation today, back in the Congo Basin. The Congo River Basin is where the river Ebola is, and that was a river that gave its name to an unpleasant disease that was confirmed by science in 1976. It jumps in, 19, in 2014 to West Africa, 2,000 odd miles. How on earth does it make that journey? We still don't know. The scientists aren't 100% certain. And when it emerges, it emerges right where I did my walk on the corner of the border, the inland border between Sierra Leone, Liberia and Guinea, a place where you can literally, if you walk 10 meters in one way, you're in one country, 10 meters in another, you're in another, 10 meters in another, you're in another. It's like a, a triangulation of three, three countries coming together. And uh, it's a place, it's an area where you know, crossing borders isn't easy for outsiders, but I was able to slip through because I didn't have a crowd, because there, was a, there wasn't a big noise. And the local authorities were seriously cool. They were welcoming, given that they'd been through the trauma of war. They had every reason to be suspicious of someone like me turning up, rucksack, camera, book about gray and green. Who the hell are you? They weren't. They were really, really embracing. They said, oh, you want to walk? Go walk. And um, they were a little bit uh, <laughs> bemused about this guy who turns up out of the uh, out of the bush. I didn't take a cousin like Graham Greene. I took a, a British mate, a younger man, the son of a dear friend of mine who came with me. So we had the, just the two of us, plus a great lo local Liberian guide on foot. And then we had a backup uh, of a guy to help us with the motorbike to move our heavier gear because the jungle there, it's not quite 43 degrees, which is what you're sitting at in Cameroon as we're having this conversation, but it was plenty hot and plenty tough. So it was a, it was a wonderful journey, very special personal experience. Yeah, and also I noticed that sometimes when you go to these borders that are remote, they tend to be much more easygoing and they tend to be uh, more relaxed and letting you slip by with less hassle than some, sometimes the bigger borders with a lot of uh, truck traffic and things like that, or lorry traffic, as you would say. Yes, I think... Um the truth is, and we might talk about this when we come to a general discussion of Africa, which is how do African countries make an income? 
you know, they don't do it from income tax because there isn't a meaningful income tax revenue system. It's very, very difficult to do that, to trace people, track people. So how do you do that? Well, you do that by leveraging and organ and uh, 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 being very careful about exports crossing borders. So you're very sensitive to tariffs and you're very sensitive to duties and taxes. That's how you make your money. So border crossings can be hellish places in Africa if you go through the mainstream ones because, as you say, you get caught up in the truck or the lorry traffic. You get caught up in, in places where officials have worked out that, oh, people cross here and we can put leverage on them. And if they're rushing, then maybe they might be incentivized to, to pay an additional fee. And let's be honest, corruption is a very real feature of life in Africa. Um, and we can discuss where those, the, the, those routes come from, perhaps. But the point is, when you're away from those truck stations, you're away from the traffic points, everything's a lot more, a lot more relaxed. And um, my sub, one of my sublime moments on the Liberian trip was getting to Liberia and knowing that Graham Greene, back in the days when borders didn't really, they hadn't even really been marked out, he had walked across a river and then ent entered a, an area that was then known as Colonial French Africa. It didn't even have the modern name, but it's now a country called Guinea, Guinea-Conakry, to, to make it different, to, to distinguish it from Guinea-Bissau and Equatorial Guinea. It is Guinea-Conakry. And um, we found ourselves in this village and, you know, the, the diary said we crossed a river and there's the river. And what's on the other side of the river? There is another country. And I have to say, you know, speaking to a local guy, getting a canoe and paddling across a quiet, calm, tannin-stained waters of an African jungle river where the leaves have been leaching into the river for centuries and the rapids are bubbling away around the corner and the village is located above the rapids because that's where the fish is, that's where the fish population is. To cross the river then, to go from one place to another, was very sublime, very special. And as I say, we were left well alone as long as, you know, we didn't, um, didn't uh, cause any trouble. Now, when you were in the Congo, Tim, did you see any remnants? Because you were describing how Henry Morton Stanley came in, but he wasn't the first uh, foreigner to ever go that deep into Africa. Of course, the Arabs were there long before any of the Europeans or Americans got to go in there. Did you see any remnants? I remember I'm reading about in Kinsang Kisingani, the, in the kind of in the middle of the Congo River, they're the first major town, I suppose, that's deep in there. There you talked to an Indian, I believe it was, uh, but did you find any Arabic traces when you were there, or is it pretty much vanished? Uh, well, there? absolutely. You, you, you can't but be aware when you're in the eastern sector, because let me just think, the, the Congo crosses a river basin. It is It creates a river basin. It's a swathe of territory which is very, very, very large. That single river, one river, drains an area bigger than India. So it's a huge, huge area, a huge country. And in the eastern sector, which is very different from the western sector because it's basically going from one side of a continent to another, um, the, the language spoken is, oh, that sounds like Arabic. It is. It's Swahili. And Swahili is the remnants of a creo of a language, an old ancient uh, remnant of the era when Arab slavers came down the east coast of Africa from what we now call the Middle East, what we now call the Persian Gulf or the Arabian Gulf, they came down on their boats and they came down with one purpose only, which was to acquire manpower, to slave. And they got to this place called Zanzibar, which is an island, and they turned Zanzibar into basically an aircraft carrier. It's the equivalent of a nuclear aircraft carrier in the American fleet today. It was safe, it was secure, it was in the sea, surrounded by the sea on all sides, and it was accessible to mainland Africa. They set up shop there and then they just nipped in and they went in further, Walked further this year, went up that path next year, and next year we went up this, and we, they avoided that tribal fighting that area, and they moved that area, they avoided that area where there was known disease, and all the time they went further into Africa, and they got as far as the Congo River Basin, which is quite funny, because if we segue back to what we were talking about, that cliched image of the Victorian explorer, Burton Speak, Livingstone, all of those guys, you know, they came back to Europe and they wrote books about how clever they were and what, you know, they were the first to do this and the first explorer. Well, they were patronizing on two levels. First of all, you know, they were the first to discover the I don't know, Victoria Falls on the Zambezi River, for example. That's a, a famous moment. I was the first person to gaze upon this, says Livingston. Well, not strictly true, because you're not the first person. Because there are some African people who've lived here for millennia. So they're actually the first. So they, it wasn't, you know, it's that slightly patronizing. And then there's a second element. And are you the first foreigner to see it? No, you're not. And why are you not? Because it was the Arab slavers who've explored this area. And how do we know 
<laughs> that there were Arab slavers because all of those Europeans, guess what, used Arab slavers to get where they got. They used their footpaths, they used their methods, they hired them. You know, Livingston and Spee, uh, all of the guy, all of the Europeans who passed through Zanzibar hired Arabic speaking, Swahili speaking members of the slaving community, community that was involved in gathering people and used them to guide them and said, well, this is the pl- where to go. And you cross the river here. You, we recommend you cross the lake here. And so Stanley had with him a bunch of slavers, a bunch of foreigners. So, yes, their influences from that era. Um, Stanley, Livingston, they all saw the slave trade at the end of this. They were doing their exploration at the end of the 19th century. And as you know from your history books, this was the period when um, slavery had been, uh, the slave trade had been banned in the British Empire. And then there was a later period when slavery per se was banned. And so that, that was an issue in terms of what the Brits were seeing. They were seeing something which was illegal recently outlawed um, and so they had to you know, they were, there was lots of you know, reference to that and how we you know we as Europeans should change our you know they should try and improve things here but though comma we should also remember what the Europeans have been doing for hundreds of years prior to that but the point is they the language is there you see it in uh, Swahili the faith is there we saw mosques in eastern, the eastern sector of the Congo, you see mosques all over the place. And that was largely from the slaving community. So, yes, you do see a strong, strong influence. Do you, and that influence exists, obviously, in the Swahili language that's spoken in that region. But when I was going through the... I, I crossed the Congo myself, but from Uganda all the way to Bangui, with the capital of the CAR, the Central African Republic. And so I kind of went through a very different part of the DRC, which is the northern part there. And I kind of, when I was reading your book, Blood River, it remind, even though it was written, I, I did my trip of just last year, but I felt like it could have been written yesterday because so many of the, your descriptions, Tim, sounded similar to what I was experiencing in the far north of, of the DRC, it, particularly how there was this decay, constant decay of everything going on, where there's these remnants of the colonial period these seemingly once uh, nice, pretty houses and the train tracks that were out there all being overgrown by the jungle. There's this, this, this constant theme of decay in the DRC, and it, and it struck me as, as having existed in your journey as well. And my question is, is maybe some of the Arabic remnants were also just decayed away before you and I ever even got there. Oh, I think so, yes. Uh, what we're seeing today are very much um, the bones of what's left and the flesh has rotted off, I would say, the Arab, you know. But you could see it, uh, interestingly, in trees, trees that were planted, flamboyants, which are not a natural tree to eastern Congo, had been brought by some of those early Arab slavers who, when they came into those parts of Africa, they didn't just come and go. They went and they set up shop. They set up homes. They dominated spaces. They dominated land. They took control of the local community. They took as many wives as they wanted to. Their best, me- their team members took wives and they, 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 they integrated is that the right word dominated is probably the better one so yes you 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 see remnants of either the fruit trees the mango tree the mango is not indigenous and yet it was brought in from the coast um yeah i think you're you're right i'm thrilled to hear you made a trip in 2017 across northern congo did you go by truck or by motorbike or by foot how did, how did you do your trip i had a toyota hilux my own i've been driving all over Africa with that thing. And so I needed to somehow get to Cameroon and I was in Dar es Salaam. And so from Dar es Salaam, I just drove up to uh, Uganda and then got to the... Did you go through Beni? Benin? No, Beni. B-E-N-I. Beni. The Benin. Congolese city. I don't remember that name of that city. Maybe I did, but I don't I don't remember it being... A... And just tell me, what were the roads like? Because getting a, four, a four-wheel vehicle, I'm very impressed. What, how were the roads? The roads were <laughs> quite disastrous. I mean, I also drove through Liberia and Sierra Leone and during the rainy season, which was kind of comparable. And this, it's just a mud fest. Um, very, very challenging. I did have a winch, which saved me a few times. But the roads are, you know, they're generous the roads. I, I, again, just thinking about what you wrote about in Blood River, your book, it was so many of the similar things where I saw these guys pushing bikes that were compl- just right, not motorbikes, but regular bicycles that were completely overloaded 
with these heavy, heavy, I don't know what they were carrying in certain cases, but you know, whether it be peanuts or whatever, and they were pushing these things up these muddy, slippery hills in their bare feet, and then they would roll them on the way down. They would, and it's just back-breaking work. And just like you described, they're doing all this stuff. They might go for a week, and then they earn, let's say, ten dollars for all that effort. And then, of course, they're getting bribed by officials along the way. I even witnessed it myself. So, so many of the things that you experienced in the early two thousands. I experienced the exact same thing and it's just kind of in some ways depressing because you would hope that during that 15 year time span that things would have improved or gotten any somewhat better in the DRC, but they haven't. I guess that is the central lead motif of my book, Blood River, which is to take you to a place which was historically important in the 1870s, so important it was the key moment for opening up the African hinterland to the white outsider. It was absolutely key. So the Congo is massively important. It's right at the, it's right at the, the, the leading edge of change. It's right, you know, the Europeans turn up there. They put in first railways are going around the Congo. Their first um, cities are going in with the Belgians. And awful things. Let us remember, ba- bad things of colonialism are happening there. But they're actually at the same time. Hospitals are going in. Clinics, infrastructure, roads, telephone lines banking systems, agriculture, transport, barge systems, navigation lights on the river, all of those things are going in. So it's at the leading edge 130 years ago. Today, it's not just at the back edge, it has been forgotten, abandoned. And that's what's so extraordinary. There are lots of undeveloped places in the world, but the Congo is spectacular for being undeveloping, going backwards. And as I say somewhere in the book, the hands of the clock spin not forwards, but backwards in the Congo, because you talk to grandparents and they sit with their gray hair, leaning chin on a walking stick. Oh, I remember when the buses would go through this area and the little children, age four and five, sitting at the feet say, Grandpa, what's a bus? What's a road? What's, what's fuel? What, 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 what are you talking about? You could go to the local town. What, what, where is this town? We've never been there. And that is the most striking thing, that the hands of the clock go backwards. You rather politely said, that's a bit depressing. It's not de- just depressing. It's fundamentally important to understand if we're going to try and, uh, try and work out a way that Africa can change its trajectory, can reach the incredible potential that it has. Because until you deal with for me, I, I'm obsessed with the Congo. It's physically at the middle of the continent. It sits there. It squats right across the equator. The equator line is there. It squats through two hemispheres, northern and south. It's always got rain. It's always got fresh water. It's an amazing place. We started this conversation about Cape Town being so dry. The Congo River, in the time between me saying ping and ping, 45,000 tons of fresh water has belched down that river. It moves 45,000 tons of water every single second of every day out into the Atlantic. Only the Amazon spews more water out into the sea, and the Amazon drains an area considerably bigger. And it does this all the time, this extraordinary place. And yet, it's a place where bridges have fallen and not been replaced, where roads have fallen and not been replaced, where the jungle has encroached and not been cut back, where railways have rusted and trains have gone silent, and so on and so on. And it is just an extraordinary experience to touch on that, to touch on what was there before, to, rem- to tell you, to educate you what might be today, and then you see what there really is. Now, which experience did you enjoy more in Africa of the, your two books, the DRC experience or your West African experience? I'm going to dodge that by simply saying I wouldn't rank them on the same ranking because they were two very different experiences. I enjoyed them both. I was thrilled by both. I was educated by both. Um, So I wouldn't say X was better. I was younger when I did the Congo. The Congo was super risky. Um, We're going through and it was an area when the war was still going on. Uh, there were so many dangers. I was told, without getting trying to be too hyperbolic, but several people said, you know, what you're attempting is suicidal. And I had no children at the time, and it was a risk. I, I felt I it was a it was something I wanted to do. I had to do. Uh, you mentioned that that resonance with working for the same newspaper that had sent Stanley. I'd also been many years in war zones, and I was a little bit fed up. I'd done, you know, even 
by the time I got to Iraq 2003, I was bored of being embedded. I'd done it so many times. You know, I was bored of military men standing up and saying, we're going to take this and it's all going to be great. It never was. Wars are mucky, muddy, horrible businesses. And it's so rare, so rare for there to be any moral clarity about a conflict. There's, but the absolute certainty is there'll always be suffering. I was fatigued by it. I was fatigued by but various things I'd seen in the Middle East and, and Africa. And I was also fatigued by journalism because everyone was doing the same thing. And I came up with this dream of the, doing a Congo trip and no one... What is the same thing? What do you think is one of these common errors that journalists make? They churn, they churn, they follow each other, they look at each other's tails, they go into a circle, it becomes a herd, everyone's chasing the same thing. Uh, you follow the stampede of the hooves. Oh, we've got to go there and do that story. Well, you don't actually, just, just think, is that an important story? No, it's not. But because it's on the internet, it's made important, so I've got to go across there. And I'm thinking, well, hold on, why can't we just be, have a bit more confidence in our own selection, in our own values, in our own judgment. And so it doesn't just, just it, you know, it's not a new story just because a paper X does it. We've got to be more confident about it. What is the theme here? What are the greater themes at play? And for me, Africa is one of the great themes. It's, it's, it's where we all come from. We're all African. You know, a millennia ago, extraordinary humans left Africa and they did it on foot and they did it without modern medicine and they did it without any survival aids or navigation aids and they populated the world. And yet Africa today, those people out beyond Africa, frame Africa in such negative terms often. And they're so patronizing and they're so haughty and they're so demeaning. That in a way, I want to say, well, hold on, let's just think about, we're all African, we're all coming there. What were the key moments? And the key moments in Africa's modern history are these moments that I mentioned earlier, which is when the white outsider suddenly gets interested, suddenly stakes the center. And when I mentioned this to my bosses, I was then on a British newspaper. You know what they said? They said, it's always been like that, and we do news. Just pause and think about that for a second. <laughs> it's always been like that and we do news. Hold on, but you know, the Congo, when I was doing it, 2004, 1,500 souls were dying every day. 1,500 people were dying in the war of the Congo from 1996 to 2003, 2004. Those numbers are much worse than any single day in Taliban-infested Afghanistan or post-Saddam Hussein Iraq. But because they were brightly lit and the, the American generals were there and the British soldiers, they get the attention. What about those 1,500 souls who are dying in, in the DRC Congo? Year, day after day, month after month. I was, I was, I was very frustrated. I actually left my newspaper job. I, I took six months off and I, I didn't know how long it was going to be. I, I just left. I, I, I went you know, off, the, off the payroll to do this trip. And they wouldn't back me. They just said, no, it's too, it's too same-ish. And I said, well, hold on, it's, okay, you can think that, I think something else, I'm going to go off. And I had no book project or book commitment from any publisher, I just went off to do something and it, it felt so lofty, so important, so magnificent when I touched on this incredible space and had this remarkable journey that I thought, well, it does sustain a book, it does sustain a narrative it does sustain exploration and i think it will i hope it'll stand the test of time one thing your listeners should know is that i did this journey in 2004 so that's 14 years ago now and i wrote the book some you know two three years later so the book comes out 2007 so the book is already 11 years old but i'm delighted that i'm still reaching an audience and i'm delighted that people are still using blood river as a way to engage with africa and to engage with important developmental questions because as you said yourself you know a year ago you were in the congo and you found the situation hadn't changed and that's the truth well in fact the same thing just when you were mentioning how there was 1500 deaths per day going on when i was planning i said okay i got to get through the drc and i and i started doing research to figure out i thought i was going to go through goma and then from goma go down to kinzangani and i was going to go see the virunga national park and from there you know do all that stuff and then i started reading about north kivu and south kivu which is in the eastern part there and there was all like hundreds of people dying uh, over the last few uh, 
months. And, and I was like, well, why don't I know about this? I only knew about it because I started digging into it, but it never makes the news. And so it was kind of the same thing that you experienced where all sorts of people are dying. There's all sorts of chaos going in North Kivu, South Kivu, even today as we're speaking, 2018. And yet there's very little coverage about it in the media. We care about Syria, quite rightly. We care about Eritrea because they, those are the two drivers for immigration. And why do we care about them? Because it impacts on the dominant economic sphere of the world, which is Western Europe. So they get very stressed about that, okay? Well, if I tell you that there are 13 million Congolese, one, three, 13 million displaced today, April 2018. We know this because the UN has convened tomorrow. Tomorrow is Friday, Friday the 13th of April. Um, so just to give you the dateline, they are having a massive UN Congress to, conference to try and gather money for those 13 million displaced people and all of the uh, connected developmental issues that go with. I mean, just pause to think about those numbers. That is bigger than anything in the world. And yet the media, of which I'm a proud part, our focus shifts because people's, you know, my news editor's words were, it's old news, Tim. The Congo has always been like that. My challenge was, my, my response to that is, that may well be true, but if it's always been that bad, we need to better understand it. We need to understand its roots. Where does it come from? You know, and his attitude was, well, you know, they were killing each other in the 1960s when uh, independence happened. And, uh, you know, we had the UN mission, the most bloody UN mission in terms of how many people lost their lives in UN peacekeeping history was the Congo in the 1960s, 61, 2, 3, 4. You know, they lost scores of lives, scores of peacekeepers lost their lives. And the UN has been burnt there twice, once in the 1960s. And yet there's a peacekeeping mission there still today. Uh, I have to say, um, I salute to you, Francis, that you planned a trip through the DRC and you made it overland. I say this because I, you know, I still monitor websites and stories and books and things. When people who go through the Congo, they tend to write about it. And I know of one person who took a Land Rover through the Congo in the last few years and wrote a book. I know one person who took a, took a pedal cycle, uh, a, a British guy called Peter Costello who, who biked through the Congo. But very few people do what you've done. So I'm impressed and, 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 and thrilled to be talking to you about it. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I just, it, to me, it's also, there's a flip side of all this discussion because sometimes we can drop down too much in the negative, but both your Blood River book as well as your Chasing the Devil book, there is an unspoken or, or an implied positive message behind it, which is as scary as these places seem to be from the outside, they're actually quite safe in many levels. I mean, you and I both traverse these places and we're here talking to each other. We both lived and, and in fact, thousands of people's do go on every day living in the DRC without big incidents. There are people who do traverse on a bicycle or whoever, however, and they come up, come out relatively unscathed. So uh, we have to kind of balance the notion that there are thousands of people or, that are dying every year through conflict that is being underreported, but at the same time, recognize that it's not all bad news and that there are people who are raising families and who are going to school and life goes on in these places and it's not a complete disaster 24 7 for 100 percent of the population yes you're absolutely right and uh, i hope that in both books i reflect that in a number of levels but one of the ways that i wanted to reflect that and i always do when i talk about the the books is to remind remind him that i only got through because of the good guidance and goodwill and good skills and good honesty of some extraordinary people you know i am a french speaking english guy stand six foot two weigh a hundred kilos there's a lot of me i stand out in a crowd i'm difficult and yet i wouldn't have been able to make it had i did not if i hadn't got those fantastic local guides and in the case of the congo there were several of them there's bunwa with his motorbike or dimbo was another motorbike guide uh george Mboy, who's a pygmy guy who doesn't stand 100 kilos he's about 40 kilos and he was a giant in eastern congo because he was able to get me through the violence and it's it's you know, 
People say to me, when I do a talk about Africa, I, I reference Africa, and I'm talking to an American audience or a British audience or European audience, I, I always get a sort of, you know, I often get a sort of slightly haughty, well, you know, it's, it's, there's so many problems there. So what do they achieve? What do they achieve? You know, have they built Notre Dame? Have they built a big, uh, you know, architect? What are their, what are their writers? Where are their writers? What, what, what's, what's all this? What's, you know, what, how, what's their output? And I say the cathedral of achievement of millions of people, be it in the Congo or Cameroon or elsewhere in Africa, is in their survival, is in the fact that they have survived in an area which is so austere in terms of physical challenges. I mentioned Ebola, Ebola, a, a hemorrhagic fever caused by a virus, a phylovirus. Of all the known phyloviruses in the world that create hemorrhagic fevers, guess where they all come from? the Congo River Basin, and then there's Lassa fever, and then there's Nile fever, and then there's this, and that, and the other, the, and then there's hunger, and then there's lack of, and, and all of these deprivations, the cathedral of achievement, you don't need to find the great flying buttresses of Notre Dame, you just need to look at the fact that there are 50 million Congolese living in this area, surviving, and it's extraordinary, and they're all doing it with um, amazingly sophisticated human interactions, tolerances, um, the ability to survive and pass on their 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 genes and their and their um, uh, maintaining their cultures and their traditions. It's an extraordinary achievement. It's absolutely amazing, and I hope that's reflected in 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 what I describe uh, my encounters with them um, in Liberia, where we have an area of, of war. I've, I find people who were predominantly a young community because living to an old age is a relative rarity. And yet I had a very sublime moment with uh, in one village where these young people said, oh, and they, what are you doing? And I'm here and I'm following Graham Greene. He, he passed through here in 1935. And one chap said, oh, well, there's an old man. He often talks about those people. He sits over here. So I went to this old gentleman and there he was, and he was ancient and he had white hair, snow white hair, and his skin was slightly pleated and, 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 and creased with age. And he said, we got talking and, uh, I was curious because you don't see old people. Where does the, Where are the old people? And the old people are, you don't live in Liberia to reach an old age because of the tough nature of existence. This cathedral of survival, it's difficult to build. So if you hack out the jungle to plant your African, West African rice, it's incredibly difficult. You get damaged, you get exhausted, you get injured, you get bitten by snakes, you get whatever. You get exposed to disease, your hunger level. So you don't get old people. But I was looking at an old man. I was looking at an 80-year-old man, 85 years old, actually. And I said, how? And, and we got talking. And then it became clear how he had got to the age of 85. His eyes were milky. They were milky with glaucoma. And he couldn't see. So he'd lost his sight. And if you've lost your sight, you can't work in the fields. And therefore, you aren't going to be exposed to the, the rigors. And this wonderful gentleman was able to, even though his vision had gone, his memory was crystal clear. And he told me of the time when this European party came through his village and he was 10 years old or eight years old. And his memory was razor sharp. He described a woman, a European woman traveling with this tall man, this man who had eyes like the sky, looking through the eyes of a skull because they were, that's gray and green. He has pale blue eyes. That was the female cousin, Barbara Green. It all worked perfectly. And Barbara Green had picked up a small monkey in her, you know, uh, along the way. And this guy describes the monkey chirping around and stealing things and being cheeky. And the final thing that drew home for me from this, because I was a little bit skeptical, because I'm, you know, asking as a journalist, you, people often People sometimes see someone with a notebook and they tell them what they want to hear. And I thought, well, um, how can I, uh, you know, wh wh how can I be absolutely certain he's not just sort of pandering to my, to my curiosity? And he said, well, no, the one thing I do remember about this European man coming through, he said, he drank a lot of whiskey. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's Graham Greene. That's exactly right. Um, which is exactly one of the, one of the great features of Graham Greene. So the man was a hundred percent right. And um, just his survival, this man's survival to be able to tell stories and pass them on was a very powerful example of what is so good so good and so great about Africa. The achievement of survival, the achievement of interconnectivity, the achievement of love thy neighbor, of building communities, the achievement of 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 of, of finding a, a way to survive in this environment is as colossal as any other human achievement. And it was wonderful to be able to touch on that on these journeys. You know African explorers better than anybody, and would you want to 
kind of, I know you don't like the term follow the footsteps of, but, you know, I was just writing today in my chapter about Mali, about uh, René Callier, the first person to get to Timbuktu and out and, and live to tell the tale. And I was just thinking about you when I was writing. I was like, huh, I wonder if Tim Butcher would like to follow René Callier's uh, footsteps and, and re, redo that journey or any other. I mean, there's so many African explorers. These guys were just incredible, the feats that they did. They're even, if you were to do them today, they're impressive. And yet they're doing it way back in the time when there was no GPS, no intercommunications, all these other things. And so if you were to pick a new journey in Africa, uh, would, it, would you follow Richard Burton or Jonathan Speak or any of these other uh, Victorian age explorers that you kind of uh, respect and admire that, uh, for what they were able to accomplish? Which one would you pick? Oh, that's the, 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 the smorgasbord is very rich and... And just make sure that your wife is not listening in because I'm sure she'll disapprove of whatever. I know she's very happy now. She just says, buy the single ticket, save us on the return. Don't worry. We'll worry about, we'll worry about if you have to buy a return ticket at the end. She's always like, she's, she's pretty cool like that. Oddly enough, um, Timbuktu is a subject close to my heart at the moment because it is sadly uh, unreachable in many ways. Uh, in the 21st century, it's, it's, it's riven with uh, Islamic um, militancy. Uh, Al-Qaeda took the city in 2012 briefly. They were driven out by the French uh, who came to support the Malian government. But um, the reason I mention that, I've just been doing some work with a, a young South African uh, person who was held hostage by Al-Qaeda. He was captured in Timbuktu in 2011, and he was held for five years and eight months. He lost five years and eight months of his life out in the Sahara Desert. And it's just got me thinking about that period where, you know, in the 21st century, in some ways, you're quite right, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's even more dangerous to go to these places than it was at the original uh, when, when Westerners were going there. But Kaye and some of the others, they had to even convert to Islam to cross some of these areas, or at least purport to. So anyway, bottom line is this. What are the trips I would love to do? I would love to go to the highlands of, the, of Guinea, the Ghanaian highlands, and find the source of the Niger River and follow it all the way past Timbuktu. As you know, Timbuktu is not quite on the river. It's just north of the river, 20, 20 odd kilometers. Um, and the Mungo Park trip would be absolutely fantastic. The one where he, he, he goes originally to um, the area I've just described, crossing, he crosses from the Senegal River, reaches the upper Niger, and then works his way down to Timbuktu and comes back. And then his second time, he dies. <laughs> so his second trip isn't so successful. And we're talking 1709. And I hope you don't want to reproduce that. Second no, we don't want to do that. We don't, we don't want to do it too, 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 uh, <laughs> too, too, too faithfully. But um, the, the, the trip, <laughs> oddly enough, is from Fez to Mecca through North Africa, where we have those early uh, people who did the Hajj uh, and were able to write down how the Hajj works and the, the span of the Islamic world. And given the the way that Islamic extremism today is dominating, I would love to do that journey as a way to go back to the, the pure origins and the pure roots. But then we can go, I mean, there's another journey into uh, Somaliland, into Somalia, into Mogadishu, where the British soldiers in 1940 from Ethiopia cross and go all the way to Mogadishu and then force the Italian troops to uh, to surrender on the beach in Mogadishu. That only lasts a few um, months, but the officer involved is a truly mad British gentleman called Ord Wingate. And that trip would be fantastic. But again, you have a problem with dying at the end of that one because Somalia is so fruity today. But then well, the, the journeys I'd love to do are the ones that have impact, that change. And strangely, I'm speaking in South Africa. In South, in South Africa, which is a very tame country in comparison to the ones we're talking about, there was an extraordinary journey that changed things. And it was the journey when the trekkers, the first white Dutch uh, Old Testament reading, purist, Calvinist, Protestant Europeans came here and they went on their ox wagons and they went all the way to the top of South Africa, which is a distance of about 1,700 kilometers and found gold and found diamonds. I still have a sort of perverse pleasure in, in wanting to follow some of those original routes. But you could go on and on forever. And uh, the fundamental route that I'm very interested in at the moment, which I'm working on for my new book, is an even more basic one, but a very difficult one to faithfully recreate. And that is the human spread of 
the world, the migration from Africa across through to the Middle East and then the populations. And we're able to, modern science is able to tell us with the genome mapping and genome mapping how this happened. And it, it gives more greater support to theories, anthropological um, theories that have been built in previous uh, centuries on, uh, on archaeology and uh, records dug up. Other things are supporting that. And I'm just fascinated by the African root of us all and how humans, what were the drivers for that? Who were those first people who said, enough of hunter-gathering here, we are going to move on. We are moving elsewhere. We're going to use the coast of Africa as a coast, as a sort of, as a, as a, um, as a, as a, as a banister, as a guide rope. We're going to just work our way up. We're going to work our way all the way, all the way and then finally we're going to cross a land bridge into the Middle East and they populate the rest of the world. It's not an individual journey that one can do, but I'm fascinated by the wider human journey, the journey of humanity. You know, humans have been around for plus or minus 200,000 years. And for 190,000 of those 200,000 years, so for well over 90%, humans were but hunter-gatherers. They just gathered and hunted, gathered and hunted, gathered and hunted. They didn't sit in large communities. And plus or minus 10,000 years ago, we suddenly create communities. We suddenly create larger conglomerations than tribes. And from those would emerge the great civilizations of Mesopotamia, the Nile Valley, and elsewhere. So we know all of that. But I'm just fascinated. What, what was that turning point that took humans out of Africa to spread around the world and then took them from being very happy with the hunter-gathering method, which has worked, lasted for 190,000 years, to, oh, bang. And we've had various scientists and anthropologists and, and writers and observers come up with theories about, you know, it was the finding of barley and the finding of cereals that were in the Mesopotamian Valley and you could have food that was more reliable than your hunting and gathering. You could have surplus. And if you have surplus, you could have specialization. If you have you know, those sorts of theories. But I, I don't, where do we end up? Well, we end up today after 200,000 years of messing around with different methods of human society. We end up with one thing only which is the nation, the nation state. And you're talking to me from a country which is called Cameroon, and that's a nation. And it's as recognizably as much of a nation as uh, the United States or uh, Samoa in the Pacific. Or where do we, how do we divide these? When do we, you know, what's, the, what's the difference here? Because you know, 10,000 years ago, the population of the world was plus or minus 10 million. Today, it's 7 billion. You know, it has gone up by, it hasn't just gone up arithmetically, it's gone up geometrically. So we've got to come up with a way to, ex to divide the same land, the same spoils amongst a much, much larger number of people. And our best answer is the nation. And so that's the journey I am doing for my new book, which is to try and explore how we've ended up with the nation state, with the League of Nations 100 years ago, with the United Nations, and with people still going on and on and on today about national boundaries, sovereignty, nationalism, populism, all of these things that are triggering our concerns with, with Trump, with his wall in Mexico, with Britain falling out of love with Europe and, and, and within Africa. You're in a country, Cameroon. Cameroon's national identity is under threat today because of the linguistic Anglophone part of the country, which wants out, wants, doesn't want anything to do with the French part of the country. And that, hold on, so how is that going to be resolved? Can it be resolved peacefully? Can it be resolved by federation? Can it be resolved by some transference of power? These are questions which I think are massively important, and I'm trying to explore those in my journey. Have you considered talking with uh, Paul Salopek, the guy who's doing the Out of Eden walk? Paul is a wonderful old colleague of mine from the Chicago Tribune. He's a very rare animal. He's won two Pulitzer Prizes for journalism. He's an extraordinary person. He won one, one prize for scientific exploration, um, for scientific writing, and he won one Pulitzer Prize in journalism, nothing to do with science, as a foreign correspondent. So the man is hugely talented. He's also hugely disciplined. And he is, as you knew, doing the Out of Eden walk, and he is following the, the route the perceived root of what I've been described, what I just described. So yes, I'm fascinated by Paul's work, and I'm fascinated by the blogs he does and the material he's generated. He is not so interested in the nation where we've ended up today. I'm interested in in how the world has got divvied up now. Why is this satisfactory? Why is it not so? Why are people getting frustrated with it? Why are people relying on it? As empires fell a hundred years ago, which we might segue into my third book there, you know, from the First World War was the great moment. 1914, the world is largely divided between the British Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the German Empire, and the Tsarist Russian Empire. I mean, you know, a vast percentage of the surface of the world's population divided in those empires. 
within four years of fighting, three of those empires have gone for good, ever. The Romanovs, goodbye. The Austro-Hungarians, goodbye. The German Empire, goodbye. Actually, a fourth, the Ottoman Empire, goodbye. And the British, when it has a slow puncture, the air is going to go slowly out of the European Empire. So I'm, and, and the, what's replaced empire? Nations. And that's what I am probably more interested in than Paul. But no, I'm, I'm fascinated with Paul. I have a huge amount of respect for him. He's a man who knows the Congo well, oddly enough. Um, one of his, uh, his second Pulitzer Prize, the one for journalism, was born largely out of three epic uh, pieces of journalism he wrote on the Congo River. So it's funny how our conversation has uh, sort of looped back on itself. I can really identify with what he has uh, done, because I've done a lot of walking myself. And I know how difficult that is. And I think back at the same people you talked about, our ancestors who walked out of Africa. And I just wonder what percentage of them died on their way out. I imagine maybe only 5%, 10% actually got to Eurasia. Um, I imagine so many of them just died on their way uh, out of the African continent. 100%. Um, and, and what will we know? Well, we'll never know. And your opinion, your gut feeling of 5%, 10%, 12%, 2%, it's as good as anybody else's. We won't know. But what's so wonderful about our world is that even in the 21st century where we think we can Google every answer and someone can explain, I love it. I love it. When we find out that we really don't know a fundamentally important thing. For example, I said that 10,000 years ago is pretty much the timeline for humans creating what you might call communities. You might call cities, towns, larger areas, larger, larger conglomerations that aren't just clan or tribe. And that's been plus or minus the, um, the expectation, 10,000 years, right? So about 40 years ago in eastern Turkey, they found some old stones. Well, eastern Turkey is full of old stones, so no big deal. And they charted it, they, they logged it. It's a place called Gobelki Tope. And um, they thought they were just the, they just thought they were gravestones on the ground, lying on the ground with a bit of dirt and soil. And if you, if you push the soil away, you could find a few gravestones. Well, that's great. You know, that's, and they didn't jar with our known timeline of humanity. Oh, you remember we're in Turkey, so we're not so far away from Mesopotamia, the place I mentioned, which was a place where barley is first farmed and surpluses are first built up and the first recorded cities of Jericho, Ur, etc., are, um, are found. So 40 years ago, they find these stones. 10 years ago, a German archaeologist says, well, let's look what's under the stones. <laughs> Maybe these stones aren't just stones lying flat on the ground. What does he find? He finds that they aren't flat stones at all. They are the tops of enormous monoliths going down into the ground. So it's like Stonehenge sunk into the ground. Enormous, great, single flanks of rock. Massive, ridiculous weight. How would you possibly move it? We wouldn't be able to move it today without incredibly expensive and heavy and complicated equipment. How could you be doing this 10,000 years ago? But hold on. These stones aren't like Stonehenge, which Stonehenge is three or 4,000 years old. These are 10, 11,000 years old, and they are much more complex than Stonehenge. They've all got incredible relief images scoured into the surfaces of them. They're telling stories hold on, this must be a religious place. This is the conclusion. And if it's a religious place, then there has to be a religion. And if there's a religion, an organized religion 11,000 years ago, then there has to be a community. And hold on, poof, the whole timeline for humanity um, at this crucial moment of going from hunter-gatherer to living in communities has to be pushed back by at least a thousand years. I love that. I love that sense that we don't know everything and we, and that we can have gut feelings, we can have intuitive senses, we can have informed um, views, but they are but views. And it's lovely when something comes along and changes our understanding. And I think that's, that's great. Well, I imagine you also love the fact that we discovered relatively recently, just a few years, a couple of years ago, that Eurasians have 2% or so Neanderthal DNA in them. I agree. I, I, oddly enough, I was thinking of mentioning that as in the same breath. You know, the, four, you know, the Neanderthal, 100% um, uh, from the genome mapping, it's, it's, unlo uh, it's allowed us to look back in time to how our ancestors behaved, and it's just extraordinary. But it, um, the other thing that a good scientist will tell you is that even though it does tell us that there was some interbreeding with Neanderthals and that the Neanderthals, and we have to change our view of how Neanderthals are looked, they had a large cranial space, larger cranial space than we did, they had sophisticated evidence of language and indeed of you know uh, coming together, 
all of that stuff needs to change our, our, our way. But the best scientists will also tell you, uh, just as soon as we find something out for certain, we also find out things we don't know. And that's what makes it such a wonderful world. It's so curious. We can still be intelligently curious about those that went before us and those that might come after us. It reminds us to stay humble. Stay humble. Absolutely. Have your eyes wide open. Be le- eager to listen, but not, uh, but, but cautious about concluding that you know everything. But I, I wanted to talk about two more things, a couple more things. I want to get, we haven't talked about the trigger at all or very little. You're just touching on it now. But I wanted to give you a chance to, to talk a little bit about that because I don't even know how to pronounce his name. Gavrilo Princip. He was Bosnian Serb, which, you know, brings us, begs important questions as to why, why would I say, you know, what do you mean by that? Well, that's his nationality in 1914, 19 in the Edwardian era. Bosnia, Serbia existed as a separate country, but Bosnia was not in Serbia. Bosnia was a province of an empire, and uh, he was not born in Serbia. He was born in Bosnia, so that makes him Bosnian. And this is important because for the for the debate as to you know how his uh, how his actions impacted upon the world, but he was an everyman. And everyman in the sense that in the era of the empires, whether it was Romanov Empire, German Empire, British Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, Ottoman Empire, those empires are largely run by a 1%, the elite, and they are run by exploiting the 99%, the everymen, the people at the bottom, those who are coerced or forced or obliged or militarily compromised. They've got to you know, pay taxes, work you, do your thing. That's how empires work, right? And that's how empires did. They were very strictly hierarchical structures. And this young man, Gavrilo Princip, was typical of an attitude that said, how do we change this? Do we change it by voting? Do we change it by debate? And various people did over all sorts of, you know, you have various periods of debate about reform and you had scientists, political scientists like Karl Marx sitting in his library in Manchester, writing his books in London, writing his books and all of this stuff. And they wrote this stuff, but then the agency for change, how does change come about? It needs actors, it needs individual actors. And history bestows upon this young boy, this 19 year old boy, quite slight in stature. He was very ill. His mum and dad were very short people. They came from a, a village over in the rural hinterland of Bosnia, a place called Herzegovina, an area called Herzegovina. And it fell to him to capture that anger, the anger of the Irishman who wanted freedom, the anger of the Indian who didn't want to be ruled by the British Empire, the anger of the Afrikaner who clashed with the Boer in Southern Africa, the Af- anger, you know, and, and so on and so on and so on. It falls to this guy, Gavrilo Princip, and he takes a gun, and he takes a gun against the senior representative of the empire that runs his land, the Austro-Hungarians. And he does something quite extraordinary. He takes a gun, he shoots the uh, this individual, and those two shots. He fired the gun twice. He shot hit one bullet hits the archduke, the other hits the archduke's wife. Uh, it's in June the twenty eighth, nineteen fourteen, and those shots, only two of them, they're still echoing through history today, more than a hundred years later, because they change everything. It's as a result of those two shots that anger is built up in Vienna. Vienna decides to take some action. It's supported by Berlin. It takes action against Serbia. Germany decides if Serbia is going to be attacked, the Russians will get involved. But we know from Napoleon, Napoleon's period that we can't possibly fight on two fronts. Therefore, we'll attack France now and deal with Russia later. So we'll go through Belgium to attack France. And the German war machine goes through Belgium to attack France. And it gets stuck in the mud of Flanders. The British get involved slowly to begin with. Uh, reluctantly or not in large numbers and then by the million and we all know the narrative of the first world war it changes everything because it destroys his empires but it starts with a kid it starts with a kid with a gun on a street corner and so that's why i set about writing the trigger in my book the hidden uh hidden europe where i examine kind of 25 different eastern european countries kind of broadly defined i talk about him and i in in one part of the book i actually say this 19 year old was the root cause of a hundred million deaths, mainly because it led to not just World War One, but because of the kind of vague and 
problematical ending of World War I, at least from the German perspective. It then therefore led to World War II. And of course, that if you add up all the deaths, you're getting close to 100 million. And I felt at the same time kind of bad blaming it all on this poor 19-year-old Bosnian Serb. And so my question to you is, since you're an expert about this, if somehow he had never been born or if he just was more of a pacifist, never or he was just a bad shot and he missed them do you think things would have turned out differently yes what did we call this the you know, the uh, the counter example of history counterfactual yeah, the counterfactual if this hadn't happened what would was it inexorable in some other way well i i don't buy the it it was definitely going to happen in the way it happened argument and i say this because we'd actually had a dummy run we'd had a dummy run of anger between the european powers this guy shoots a gun he inspires the European powers who were intensely uh, aware of each other, they were boxing each other, they were shadow boxing, they were very, very worried about who was going to be the dominant one. A huge rivalry over the decades and indeed centuries as to who is primus inter pares of the great European powers of these empires I mentioned. Is it Austria-Hungary? Has their day come and gone? Is it Russia? Is it Germany, the new kid on the block? Is it Britain stuck away on its island over there? What about France? You know, where, who actually, who were the dominant you know, who's kingpin? And some historians will say, well, it was inevitable that they were going to come to blows. They would 100% had to come to blows, and they came to blows just because of principle. Therefore, principle isn't important. I disagree. They had a dummy run. They had a very good dummy run over a number of crises that could have precipitated war, and they fell back. They chased, they decided not to. And one of them, oddly enough, was the Agadir crisis in Morocco, which is a territorial acquisition crisis where the French and the Germans got, came to, almost came to blows in the Edwardian era of just a few years before 1914. And strangely, Bosnia itself in 1910. We had an annexation crisis because Bosnia itself was annexed by Austria-Hungary, not just occupied, they'd occupied it since the 1870s, but they decided, oh, we're going to stake our, we're actually going to annex it now, we're going to take it, we're going to put our flag on it, it's going to be ours. And there was a crisis there, and all of the same key components that played out in 1914 were there in 1910, and they didn't run spool out into the events of the First World War. So, I, my argument is, well, there's proof of a case where war did not happen, even though there's very similar ingredients are, are there. But then historians, you know, two historians in a room, three opinions. You can have, you know, you can work it out any, any different way. I've had very wise historians that tell, tell me, well, if it wasn't Gavrilo Princip, it would have been a nationalist. It could have been an Irish nationalist, a young, high, uh, angry Irish nationalist who threw a bomb in London and killed the British king because of Britain's occupation of Ireland at the time. That could have precipitated. What about an Indian nationalist? What about in Africa? Could it have been something? And there are various other things. The point is, you, don't, you can't settle it 100%. I've given you a, an example of where it didn't happen. There are other, others who would argue it would. But all we can say with certainty is that events bestow on this young kid, Gavrilo Princip, this extraordinary mantle, this extraordinary status. You have got no reason to be ashamed to describe him in your book of, uh, as a young man who precipitated 100 million deaths. He did. He is, without doubt, the most impactful assassin in history. There is no individual act of assassination that led to have su to had such an impact as Gavrilo Princip's actions on that Sunday morning at 10.30 on a clear June Sunday morning in 1914 in the Central Balkans, in the Western Balkans. Um, so history bestows on this young man this great importance. What I was intrigued about wasn't so much the arguing about, oh, what happened if you hadn't done it? It was the issue of how, how did this action spin out into the second into the first world war why was a guy shooting a gun on a street corner and well people say assassination it's very important not a bit of it in the night in the early 20th century assassination was going on all the time american politicians american presidents they've been assassinated french premiers they've been assassinated british diplomats they've been assassinated queen victoria herself couldn't travel on the streets of london safely for fear of assassination it was a very common way of dealing with political issues sadly but that was the truth of it so it's not just the case that assassinate so what was it about it and this is where it becomes particularly interesting because gavrilo princip has been grabbed by all the different sides in the first world war and shape-shifted they have made him into what they want to make him. They've made him into a Serbian agent. Those who want to defend what Austria-Hungary did said, well, clearly he wasn't a Bosnian. He was Serbian. 
And you'll read many histories where the words Bosnia doesn't, doesn't, doesn't even appear. It just says the boy, the Miss Man was a Serbian person. And that filters into the record that he was in some way connected with Serbia or run by Serbia. I'm very willing to accept that if there's any evidence. But what I found so rewarding in the trigger work I did was stripping away all of the propaganda and all of the spin and trying to find what, is, what, can, we be, what can we say with certainty. And it's extraordinary how many errors have been introduced over the years, over the century. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating story, and I highly recommend uh, checking out the Trigger book uh, by uh, Tim Butcher. It's, it's uh, something that really I think a lot of people haven't realized, and it also has perhaps even repercussions with the Yugoslav Wars and on and on. And, and there's still a place that's places in, in the, the Balkans that are not 100% resolved. The Balkans, is, it's not the last time we're going to hear about the Balkans. 100%. In the week we are speaking and recording this interview, we have a election in Hungary which has returned a leader who is unashamedly, unabashedly right-wing. I mean, let me be honest. You know, he is racist. He talks about foreign invasion of his country when there are very few Muslim. He talks about Muslim invasion. He, when he says foreign, it's a euphemism for, 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 uh, for Muslim. There are very few no meaningful numbers in Hungary, but he still presses that button and it resonates with the public. So the Balkans, as Churchill said, the Balkans is a small area, but it produces more history than it can consume. And it continues so to do. <laughs> That's very well said. Uh, speaking about a place that, cons- that produces quite a bit of uh, interesting history, let's, let's wrap it up with going back to Africa. A lot of people feel that Africa is broken, do you feel it's broken? And if it is broken, why is it broken? I think, I think um, the way I frame it, or the debate seems to be framed, is are you an Afri optimist or an Afri pessimist? Do you think that Africa is rising and good to go and it's wonderful news? Or, are you, oh, it's all doomed to failure, doomed to failure. I take a middle route and say I am neither an optimist nor an, uh, a pessimist. I am an Afri realist. I will take you to the Congo and I will tell you the scale of the problems. I will take you to Liberia and I will give you a flavor of just how problematic it is. And broken is the word. Infrastructure is so broken in these places. Industry is so broken. But there's no reason it can't be transformed and it's no reason it can't be taken off. It's a strange segue for me to make, but when when Gavrilo Princip, the assassin who shoots the Archduke in 1914, is born, he's born in a house without a cement floor, a beaten earth floor. He has eight siblings. Of those eight siblings, all but two will die. So you know, only three children out of nine will survive. So that's n- three children out of nine born in a house where the parents have no meaningful economic activity, they have no health care, no meaningful education. Oh, doesn't that sound African to you? And that's Europe. That's Europe. That's Europe. And not that long ago either. Exactly. Exactly, Francis. Only a few generations ago. And I've had this conversation over the years. Oh, what about, and I remember talking to Sweden. Sweden is, for me, the height of modernity and sophistication. And I was talking to a, an elderly Swede about Gavrilo Princip. And he said, well, you're right. You know, when I was born, you know, we were rural community. We didn't have cities. We didn't have any of these things that you assume today. And it has been transformed in a very, very short order. So... That's Western Europe. I see absolutely no human talent issues with Africa doing exactly the same thing. It has incredible resources of human talent. They'll take it through the roof. It has incredible natural resources, which will take it through the the roof. What it doesn't have is something very important, which is settled economic framework, settled nation states. And the the reason you said, you asked very clearly, is Africa broken? And if so, why? I would say it is broken in large part because the Europeans who came and meddled in Africa, their worst meddling was creating nation states that aren't sustainable, that aren't meaningful. Do people in Nigeria cheer for Nigeria? Do they pay tax to the Nigerian exchequer so that the Nigerian government has money? Do they trust the Nigerian police force to come and deal with an issue if there's a policing issue? Do they trust the Nigerian post service to deliver a letter? The answer to all those questions is no, because Nigeria as a country struggles. And it struggles because it's a cumbersome thing created by a bunch of white colonials. Similarly, Congo, DRC, was created by a bunch of white colonials. They drew up a framework. 
It's an odd shape for a country that's big as India, draining an area, a river, which I mentioned earlier, which covers an area bigger than India, but it has a coastline which is four miles long. It has no coastline. It's absolutely insane. And yet that was drawn up because of a compromise with the Portuguese who were rang with the Belgians at the time, and the Portuguese took Cabinda north of the river, yada, yada, yada. The point is that the boundaries of Africa created at independence a number of countries that had no critical mass. Critical mass in terms of people who believed in those states and are prepared to work for those states. And that's what you need. You need a common faith, common purpose, community, in order for that to for those countries to take off. Um, is, does this sound patronizing? Perhaps it does. How dare a white person pontificate about, about um, Africa? But I, as a white person, would point at Europe and say how ridiculous Europe was as nation states, how difficult it's been to draw boundaries, how much blood has been spilled, how much treasure has been uh, had to be spent sorting these issues out. And the First World War was largely about exactly that, creating communities where there was enough common identity for people to want to work together in a sustainable way. And that would be the key for Africa, getting people to be willing to trust their neighbors, work together, pay money to a central exchequer and rely that that central exchequer will provide services that will make them sleep easy in their beds. And until that happens, I think there's going to be huge problems in Africa, but it's possible for it to happen in a very, very short order. It needs a leap of faith, it needs leadership, it needs standards, it needs a different degree of transparency, and it needs an intolerance, an absolute intolerance for people stealing money. An absolute, this is absolutely unacceptable. And it happens, you know, that intolerance is being shown. I'm speaking from a country, South Africa, where the president up until a few weeks ago, is currently on trial for corruption. And that is nothing but a good thing. It won't be sorted out tomorrow, not just his case, Jacob Zuma's case, but the wider issue. But it shows a nice way forward. And I think the potential is extraordinary for Africa. And I just hope that it's in my lifetime that we see my realism is able to flip from realism to optimism. Yeah, is South Africa going to, in your crystal ball, is it going to become Zimbabwe light? Or do you think it's going to take a different path because with this kind of confiscation of land issue, those types of things that are in the news, uh, do you think that's going to go down that path or is it just too big to fail and therefore too many people are going to come in to try to make sure that doesn't degrade economically? So very briefly, Zimbabwe 20 odd years ago took the decision we have run out of money because we don't have a tax base and we are going to start stealing things from private owners. We are going to nationalize assets and that basically meant we are going to invade farms owned by white successful commercial farmers. That's crudely what happened. And with that, the whole economy collapsed, law and order collapsed, refugees flooded out of the country, uh, tyranny rose, democracy fled. Um, accountability through media all, all disappeared. Um, for independent press were driven out. Independent judges were hounded out, murdered, killed. A truly tyrannical regime in Zimbabwe. And frankly, it, it is still yet to fully recover from that chaos. And the issue is South Africa, which is Zimbabwe's physical neighbor to the south, a much larger country, uh, now, uh, as a result of the uh, collapse of apartheid run by the uh, majority party, which is a black party, Will they go down the route? Will they run out of money and na steal things? Will they nationalize? And my answer to that is no, they will not. And the reason they won't is that they're too sensible and they're too sensible because they're held to account. Uh, the, the talent here is too great and they're held to account by a civil society which is greater than it is anywhere else in Africa, and it was in Zimbabwe 20 odd years ago, what is civil society? That is journalists asking questions and having the strength and the protection under the law. They're having ju judges who are protected under the law. And what is that law? There is an extraordinary thing here, the, U the Constitution of South Africa, negotiated at the end of apartheid by Nelson Mandela and his team, long, long drawn out discussions, and they created a constitution with the Constitutional Court, which is the ultimate authority in the land. The president cannot be found out by the Constitutional Court to have broken the constitution. He has to change, he or she has to change their behavior. Uh, and so I am confident that those structures are different from Zimbabwe and will therefore lead to a different scenario. Will it be bumpy? Hell yeah. 
Will it be a roller coaster? Oh, yes. And with the roller coaster, there'll be moments when the peaks are very high and you can see far across the horizon. And then there's going to be dips where your stomach is going to be by your ankles and you rip at the bottom and it's going to be ghastly. But where are we going to end up? We're going to end up in a different place from, from, from Zimbabwe. And that is because I have faith and I don't have knowledge. I can't say with certainty. Can't look in a crystal ball. Who can? Which, which Delphic Oracle is going to lie to you and say, it is about faith. Do you have faith? And I have faith in those structures that I mentioned. Judiciary, free press, etc., etc. And they are they have shown themselves as recently as the last few weeks when Jacob Zuma, a president, a sitting president, was ousted constitutionally, got rid of constitutionally, long before his time was served. And that just doesn't happen in Africa. You know, that you know, there are not coups that are constitutional in Africa. They tend to involve soldiers and guns and tanks and blood this was a constitutional coup the man had crossed the line was found out by the system the system exposed it and the system dealt with him so i hope that that system is going to be rigorous and strong enough to avoid a zimbabwe style path in the future let's hope you're right i i think i i agree with you i agree that it's not going to be a perfect parallelism and i hope that they uh, definitely take the wiser road down. It sounds like they are going in the right direction in that sense. Um, now, I really appreciate your time. Uh, Tim Butcher, the author of Blood River, Chasing the Devil, The Trigger. Where can people find you online, Tim? They can find me online by just putting Tim Butcher into any search. That'll take you to either my my website, and with that has a contact uh, page on it or to wikipedia page and the normal routings you know on facebook etc uh, i'm very accessible i do love to hear from readers because I, I i i know a fair amount but i don't know everything and i love hearing stories you've opened my eyes you yourself told me you got a hilux it's a four-wheel drive vehicle from uganda through to bangui crossing the bangui river into central african republics and that blew me away uh, earlier on in this conversation i had no idea that that road was open that must something to do with the Chinese, putting some infrastructure in there. Uh, it would be worth exploring. I'm absolutely fascinated. And I love to hear from readers who have opinions, sometimes critical. And I've got, hopefully got better at this process of writing books because I've, I've been willing to, uh, I've been lucky enough to have some good feedback from, from honest criticism. So the books are not perfect, but they were my best shot at taking on fantastically interesting and rewarding subjects. And I hope they would be proved to be similar reads for, for anyone who tries them. And I know the trigger book is just brand new and out, so I feel terrible asking you this question. But uh, when is the next one that you said you're working out? This kind of out of Africa book. That the you... nation state. Um, the nation state. The cre- the domination of the nation state. Hopefully, in 2019. So next year. But I'm I am coming up against some some research issues that are taking me down some wormholes. So uh, I'm having a bit of an issue dealing with that. But hopefully, within about a year or so. Um, as you know, writing books. Uh, it's easy to write a bad book. You can write a bad book very quickly. Uh, the challenge is to 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 find something that that is has has weight, has heft, has engagement, has passion, and has conviction. And um, I find that takes a bit of time. <laughs> so I can't just turn the tap on. I wish I could. Sometimes I wish I was I was I was writing novels. Hey, novels! You just make it up. It would be wonderful to make stuff up, but I, I um, and then the cynics out there would say, "Hold on, you're a journalist. You do you do make it up. You're in fake news." And I say, and, I, and then I say, "Well, hold on. There are good journalists and there are bad journalists. You know, there, there's a range, and I hope I belong to one end of a spectrum, which is different from the others." And that concludes this episode of the Wander Learn podcast, where we explore travel technology and transformation. If you'd like to see the show notes with links to what we talked about, or if you'd like to comment on the show. Or if you'd like to ask me a question, then go to wanderlearn.com and click on the latest episode. If you'd like to connect with me, just remember F. Tapon. That's my first initial and my last name. F. Tapon is the username I use on all social media. You can also get to my website by going to ftapon.com. Here's one last reason to remember F. Tapon. If you like what I do and want to get rewarded for supporting my projects, then go to patreon.com slash... Yep, you guessed it, F-Tapon. That's where you can pick up some sweet rewards for as little as $1 a month. And remember, subscribing to the WanderLearn podcast helps, but downloading each episode helps even more. Please share the podcast, review it, and sign up for my newsletter at WanderLearn.com.